It's my pleasure today to briefly introduce our topic and then also introduce our exceptional panel of speakers. The procedure we're going to follow is that we'll have uh, our four panelists as well as, as a couple of very short videos before the coffee break at about 4.15. After the coffee break, there will be opportunities for you as participants to make interventions, make comments, and ask questions. So the new child labor report that came out from the ILO last week reports that there are 11.5 million children engaged in child domestic labor worldwide. They are paid, they are unpaid, they perform cooking, cleaning, ironing, uh, child care, caring for the elderly in their employers' homes. Focusing on this sector is very important for several reasons. First, it's the one sector of child labor that overwhelmingly involves girls. Also, because it takes place in the home, child domestic workers are often excluded from labor laws, they are at increased risk of abuse, and the least likely to get help. Families may believe that sending their daughters to cities may offer them a better life. Millions of women, millions of girls, are moving from being abused, working long hours for little pay and with no rest. Focusing on this sector is also appropriate because it is one of the most hard to reach uh, segments of child labor. Monitoring and enforcement mechanisms often don't reach into the home. And many child domestic workers, because of their isolation, don't know what programs and services are available to them. This topic is not only important, but it is particularly timely. Two years ago, the ILO adopted a new domestic workers convention. This is one of the um, most extraordinary advances in labor rights. The groundbreaking convention includes provisions to end child domestic labor and to protect children who are above the minimum age and legally allowed to work. This convention is one of our most important tools in ending child domestic labor. And it's exciting that 10 countries from all, almost every region have already ratified it. I know that some of those countries are represented here today, Uruguay, South Africa, the Philippines, and hopefully others as well. The other reason why this topic is timely is because there's one exception in the new child labor report from the ILO. It, re it says that across the board, child labor rates are declining but there's one exception. With the area of child domestic labor, numbers have risen by over one million in the last four years. So what we see is a challenge before us, but also a lot of momentum that has been developing with the new convention and with national legislative strategies and reforms. So I think we're gonna have a very rich uh, discussion this afternoon. I'm gonna introduce our four panelists first. And then we're going to watch a very short video, three minutes, to introduce the topic before we hear from our speakers. Our first speaker is going to be Myrtle Whitboy. She's the General Secretary of the South African Domestic Service and Allied Workers Union. She's also the chairperson of the International Domestic Workers Network. She's a former domestic worker herself and was a very powerful spokesperson and advocate during the negotiations of the Domestic Workers Convention. She's been part of the struggle for decent work for domestic workers for many decades and is a real leader in the movement. Can everyone hear okay? It's okay? Great. Our second speaker to my direct right is Manuela Tomei. She's the director of the Conditions of Work and Equality Department at the ILO. She was also the primary ILO staff person who supported and led the negotiations of the Domestic Workers Convention two years ago and has been one of its foremost advocates. We'll then watch another short video on best practices and then hear from two speakers to speak with us about how we can confront child domestic labor, speaking from their own experience. Um, the empty seat to my right over there belongs to Juan Andres Robello 
who is the General Inspector for Work and Social Security for the Government of Uruguay. Uruguay was the very first country to ratify the Domestic Workers Convention, and they have some lessons to share with us. And then our final speaker before the coffee break is Diana de Vever Inga, who's the National President of SUMAPI, uh, a domestic workers organization in the Philippines that has been doing outstanding outreach and organizing among child domestic workers. Uh, she herself began working as a domestic worker when she was nine years old, so she certainly knows this topic very well. So now we're gonna watch a very short video. Thank you. Millions of women, millions of girls, are moving from villages to cities, from one country to another country, seeking employment as domestic workers. Migrant domestic workers will travel often to a country where they don't even speak the language. And in these circumstances, if they run into trouble, if they're being exploited, if they're being abused, they often don't even know who they can turn to for help, even how to contact the police. They're really at the mercy of their employer. This is what human rights organizations say is taking place unchecked in a number of Lebanese homes. Abuse and violence against and violence against domestic workers. Domestic work is often not part of the labor code of many countries. And because domestic workers are working in private households, they're very removed from the public eye. Their employer may confiscate their passport so that they're literally trapped. And so as a result, they often will put up with the most extreme conditions, the most extreme abuse, excessive work hours, 14, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, as well as physical, emotional, and even sexual abuse. A lot of domestic workers begin working when they're very young. Girls will start when they're 11 or 12, or in some cases, even at younger ages, at seven or eight. There's at least 15. There's at least 15 million children worldwide that are employed in other people's homes. Many of them are girls from very poor rural areas, and they see domestic work as an opportunity for a better life. But too often the reality is completely different. <laughs> Domestic workers have become powerhouses on behalf of their rights, speaking up, demanding rights, and saying, we will not stop until we are recognized. In June of 2011, the members of the International Labor Organization adopted a new convention for domestic workers. For the first time, we now have global standards that recognizes domestic workers are, in fact, entitled to basic labor rights. It prohibits child labor, which means that children who are too young should not be involved in domestic work. It is a moment of, of hope. Domestic workers who have been excluded for many years now see their countries adopting laws to make sure that their rights are protected. Governments can make a dramatic difference in the lives of millions of women and girls by putting the Domestic Workers' Convention into practice and to end the abuses that they suffer.